Last time on asymptotic notations, we spent way too much time taking a look at big O notation. In fact, in retrospect, I should have totally broken that down into two episodes, but well, that's too late to think about now. Hopefully that previous episode has given you a good idea of the big O notation in general, both in terms of its definition, as well as a shortcut on how to prove it using limits. What we're going to do this episode is we're going to consider some alternative types of notations in a very similar vein to the big O notation. Also in this process, we will be thinking of their purpose as well as, you know, how they're different from the big O notation. You're watching episode 3 of Asymptotic Notations. Hello and welcome back to Asymptotic Notations. At the end of the previous episode, I showed you a little example of why Big O Notation could have a little problem, and that is in the fact that it just specifies an upper bound. This upper bound technically does not need to be a tight bound, and what that means is, well, you can actually make some statements that basically are quite meaningless. So having that in mind, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at several different types of notations, including one that sort of fixes that problem. So without further ado, let us jump right in. We're going to first take a look at the omega notation. The big omega notation is defined something like this. In fact, you notice it is almost exactly the same as the big O notation, but there is one difference. The difference is in the ordering of these two terms. Instead of having CGN serve as an upper bound to FN, instead, CGN is going to serve as the lower bound. And that is why we say in a definition that CGN must be greater than 0 and FN must be greater than CGN. So you can imagine the graph to be almost exactly the same as what we've seen last time, except now the line for CGN is below that of FN. So now that we've seen the definition of the big omega notation and we can sort of compare it to the definition for the big O notation, you'll notice that in fact, if you want to use the big omega notation by definition, the technique is basically the same as that of big O notation. It's just that now, you know, the thing you introduce, in other words, CGN, is actually a lower bound, not an upper bound. Everything else is the same. Even when it comes to proving this using the limit method, it looks almost exactly the same as well. Instead of trying to make the limit less than infinity, this time we want to make the limit greater than zero. So the technique you want to use to arrive at that is exactly the same. Just divide fn by gn and then take the limit as n goes to infinity. So these two notations are in fact very similar. They bear so many resemblances but they are actually looking at a very different quantity. Some possible applications of the big omega notation include just trying to figure out at least how much time a particular algorithm needs to take. So there's the big omega notation. And in fact, if you think about it, it suffers from the same issue as the big O notation. The bound doesn't have to be tight. I mean, if you think about it, every algorithm is probably omega one because, well, every algorithm needs to take at least constant time, which seems to make sense. So once again, this is a notation that doesn't really enforce a tight bound. So what does? Good question. This allows us to move on to the next notation, which is the actual useful one that sort of forces you to create a tight bound. This is called the big theta notation, and its definition is something like this. Now, this one is slightly more complex, even though we are still stuck with just fn and gn, we now need to find a gn that works as both an upper and a lower bound. This is challenging because we have to use the same gn. One of them needs to act as a lower bound, and one of them needs to act as an upper bound. And the only thing you can change between these two versions of gn is the coefficient c1 and c2. So when it comes to the graph, it looks something like this. These two are exactly the same curve, just scaled to different levels. Fn must be greater than the lower bound 
and smaller than the upper bound at the same time, past the certain threshold. So of course, compared to the two notations you've seen earlier, namely the big O notation and the big Omega notation, you realize that this is the most useful of the lot, since it gives you a lot more information. When it comes to proving this notation using the limit method, well, now we have two things to look out for. We evaluate the limit the same way, but now to show that fn equals to theta gn, we're going to need to have the result be greater than zero and smaller than infinity. So now there are two conditions to check. And that is the big theta notation, and is arguably the most useful of the lot. Now, there are actually two other notations, which I feel are quite a bit less used, but we're going to very quickly cover them anyway. And these are the little o and the little omega notations. Now, I'm going to show you four notations on screen at the same time, so you can compare and contrast. Little o is exactly like big O, except now the inequality is strictly less than, as opposed to less than or equals to. Same deal for little omega, the relation is strictly less than. Now, when it comes to proving these two relations using the limit method, you have to get them exactly equals to zero or exactly equals to infinity. And the purpose for doing so is to ensure that the function gn is strictly less than or strictly greater than fn. And that would be for the little omega and the little o notation respectively. These two are supposedly less often used in computer science. Normally in computer science, we really use the big O notation the most, followed by the big theta notation. But of course, for the sake of completeness, we've taken a look at basically all of them. And we've understood, you know, their shortcomings, as well as their mechanism, how they actually work. I want to emphasize again at this point that all of these notations are simply mathematical concepts. They don't have to mean something in computer science. And if we use them in computer science, we of course have to make it clear whether we're talking about time complexity or space complexity. Well, that basically wraps it up for the entire series. We've covered basically everything I wanted to talk about with regard to asymptotic notations. Of course, we've put the most focus on big O notation, but hopefully this series has helped cover ground on the entire subject as a whole. Anyway, that's all there is for this episode and for this series. Thank you very much for watching. Of course, if you have any queries, do leave a comment. I will try to respond to you as soon as I can. But yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for watching. And until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may be interested in a playlist of my earlier work on computing and computer science topics. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.